All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first official session of the Good Business Colorado Level Up Academy. Uh, you are in the room um, for uh, New Business Laws in Colorado with Wes Garnett. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Megan. And good morning to everyone who's joining this session. Again, my name is Wes Garnett. I'm the president and CEO of W. Garnett & Associates. We're a human resource consulting company that helps small to mid-sized companies maneuver some of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, state and federal compliance regulations. A couple of housekeeping points. Unfortunately, I will not be answering questions during or after the presentation, but I will be at the end of my slide presentation will be my contact information. If any of the attendees today have additional questions that were generated during the presentation, you can call me and we can schedule a 30-minute free session for me to answer any questions you have about your presentation or about HR compliance. Secondly, as you might be aware, these regulations have a lot of components attached to them. Please read each of these regulations yourself. Become intimately associated with them so you know how they impact you and your company. You know, what we've done, we've reviewed all of these regulations and picked out what we think are the highlights to each of these regulations in the state of Colorado. And that's what we're presenting. But again, there are, there are a lot more detail to some or all of these compliance regulations. So let's get started. And again, we're going to be discussing the new laws in the state of Colorado and, and how they impact employers. The specific laws we're going to be covering are Equal Pay for Equal Work Act, Protecting Opportunities and Workers' Rights Act or POWER, Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance or FAMILY, Colorado Healthy Families and Workplace Act, Colorado Notice Requirements Regarding Unemployment Insurance, Colorado Bag Fee and Plastic Bag and Styrofoam Band, and the Colorado Security Savings Program. Equal pay for equal work. It became effective January 2021. This act applies to all of Colorado companies and employees as well as remote. The act prohibits, this law prohibits any employer to discriminate, including gender and identity, along with Colorado discriminate. There's a Colorado Discrimination Act that we all must adhere to. And this law, equal pay for equal work, applies. And what it means is you cannot discriminate by sex in terms of station if the work is requiring the same skills, effort, and responsibilities, except for certain reasons. There could be wage differentials if you have a seniority program. There could be wage differentials for merit, for a merit system, for a system that measures earnings on the quality and quantity of production, a difference based upon geographical locations where the work's being formed, if there's any special training, education, or experience required, and if the position requires travel. There could be wage differences between employees for those areas that I've outlined. What you can't do as part of your hiring process with current as well as new prospects, you can't determine their wage based upon history. That is illegal in the state of Colorado. It's been illegal for some time. You cannot discriminate with employees or prospective employees for failure to share their wage history with you. And also, you can't discriminate 
retaliate for employees who are involved if they won't share other people's wage information. As well as in the state of Colorado, it's legal for employees to talk about what they make. So get comfortable with one employee to the next. As you might remember, there was a time when sharing your wages was a no-no. It was a total no-no, and it wasn't done in the workplace. That is no longer the law. And in fact, the state of Colorado, as well as other states, are encouraging employees to share wage information. It prohibits, as a condition of employment, wage information. And it requires employees should not have employees sign where you can't disclose your wage information and you're not able to share your wage information. Again, we still have employees that have documents, documentation that they're asking employees to not to share in wage information. That is illegal in the state of Colorado, and I would suggest you ban that practice immediately. What the act does require of employers is when you're posting help wanted ads, communicate that internally with your staff. Determine a wage range. Have a job description. Have benefits. All of that information should be in your process. I would, I would ask you to consider for each of your companies to have a compensation philosophy. If you're not sure of what that is, let's schedule this 30 minute time so I can share that with you. Have a, what equal pay for equal work is asking employers to do within this comp philosophy. It requires you to have a job description. It requires you to have a pay range. It requires you to keep certain information, which is what you want to do whenever you're posting job openings, internally or externally. Okay. There are two exceptions to the transfer, transparency in posting. Companies are able to have career development for their staff as well as career progression. Career development. West Garnett works for you. You could put me on a career track of promotions that doesn't have to be posted whenever opportunities present themselves, as well as career progression. If I'm a, an accountant one and a promotion for me is an accountant two position, that does not have to be posted whenever those names present themselves. You could just move me into that slot if I'm on a career progression track. Equal pay for equal work, back pay can go back as far as six years for wrongful underpaid employee employees. So I would ask you at some point to do an audit on your compensation structure, identify positions where there's a gross discrepancy in what one person is making compared to another person, and let's put a program in place that's going to address that disparity. The act authorizes the Department of Labor and Education to investigate any claims of equal pay for equal work. What the state would like is to keep these type of claims court. And the state has also provided a lot of information for companies around equal pay for equal work. And we provided a website, a, a link for you to go to, give you additional information about equal pay for equal work. One thing I would say about equal pay for equal work is transparency. Be transparent with the hiring process, both internally as well as externally. Equal pay, <clears throat> uh, protecting opportunities and workers' rights act or power. It became effective just last month. It applies to all Colorado companies. All Colorado companies must ab abide by power. Power prohibits discrimination, again, under Colorado Disabilities, <clears throat> Anti-Disabilities Act, as well as power. You discriminate based upon disability, race, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender, identity, gender expression, religion, or age. Powers, the powers added marital status. Under power, you cannot discriminate based upon marital status. That's the addition 
to the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act, the marital status. What power has debunked or rejected is this long, current federal standard of severe and pervasive. Under the federal statute or the federal standard for sexual harassment, harassment is severe and pervasive. What power has done is lowered the standard for employees. An employee can now bring a name against their employer, in some cases, for one act, not a series of acts that can be considered severe and pervasive for just one act. Power has also implemented record-keeping requirements as well as non-discrimination provisions, which we'll discuss as I go through the presentation. What the Act wants them to do is to, to develop internally your own preemptive program to address harassment and discrimination. In your program, you want to be able to address any behavior that can be construed as offensive, discriminatory, or retaliatory. In the program that you develop, discrimination or accommodation immediately. It's going to be awful hard in court. If it goes that far, for you to say, employer, we're concerned about harassment within our company, and it's taking you weeks to react to that claim. In this preemptive program that you develop, for the, somewhere in there, there should be, it should state a policy, your policy on harassment, your policy on discrimination, and a complaint process. Have a complaint process. If an employee feels he or she has been retaliated, discriminated, or harassed, there's a process that they can follow. You have an outline. It's been communicated to all of your employees, and you're addressing it immediately. Again, I would recommend in this process that you develop it, develop, be an opportunity for an employee. Once you're informed, once the company's informed, that somebody is addressing with the complainant the process that will be followed. Now, you're not going to rectify the process immediately, but you sure can address the process immediately. Power, as I've indicated early record keeping requirements. Under power, if you get a claim of discrimination, harassment, I'll date that complaint, identify the complaining party, if the complaint was anonymous, you have to identify the alleged perpetrator and the substance of the complaint. The act requires you to do these three points on any claim of discrimination or a request for accommodations. You have to document these things. If the act also requires companies to develop what's called a repository of where you're going to keep all of this information. You're going to keep all of this information on claims of discrimination, harassment, and accommodation requests in your repository. This repository could be a spreadsheet. It could be a hot, it could be kept in hard copy or electronic format, or it could be kept in an HRIS software system. As long as the records are maintained and they're easily located. You don't want to have your information for power, for power scattered amongst several locations. This repository should, so all of your, all of your information is in a single location. The act requires employers all to keep personnel information. We were always required to keep personnel information. Under power, they've included some additional documents and they have increased the time frame with a lot of the personnel information, three years was the benchmark. You had to keep most of the personnel information for up to three years. Under power, it now has to be kept for five years. And what you have to keep from a personnel standpoint are any requests for accommodations, any complaints of discrimination and harassment, Applications of employment, records relating to hiring, 
promotion, demotion, transfers, records requiring layoffs, terminations, rates of pay, and other compensations, selections of training and apprenticeship programs, and any special training you're requiring the employee to go through. All of this information should be kept in your repository. The Act also requires companies to discontinuing non-disclosure provisions. And what the Act defines as a non-disclosure provision, it's a provision that limits the employee or prospective employee's ability to disclose or discuss any alleged discrimination or unfair practices of discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. I'm ashamed to say we still have companies that have these type of provisions as a part of their companies. Under power, they're no longer allowed. Power has put stringent guidelines on companies who want to use non-disclosure agreements. If you're interested in using a non-disclosure agreement, here's a website you can go to that'll tell you what you have to do if you're using a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA. For those companies still using NDAs, if you're violating the agreement, it could be a penalty of $5,000 per violation, as well as damages, reasonable cost, and attorney's fees. So please be careful if you're still using NDAs and make sure you're reviewing the checklist on NDAs. My recommendation would be to stop using NDAs moving forward because, again, the state has outlawed it. Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program, or FAMILIES. Family, it's a program for all Colorado employees now have access to a paid leave program. This paid leave program is for employees as well as their families. Under this families program, employees can use families for a number of reasons. I know you, I know all of you remember January 1, whenever you were asked to begin to pay premiums or wages on your employees. That started January 1 of 2023. And the employee share of family is 0.45% of the employee's wages through 2024. 20, 2025 and beyond, the annual premium will be provided by the director of family based upon a scale and a monetary value of the fund for each year. So through 2024, we know the, the share that employees and employers are going to pay will be 0.45%. After 2025, we don't know that as of yet. Employers with 10 or more employees are also required to pay 0.45% of wages. So this insurance program is getting 0.9% of wages set aside, paid for by the employer and the employee of companies with 10 or more employees. Companies with fewer than 10 are only paying the 0.45 or the employer, the employee share of the premium. And the, the act allows the employers to pay the employee share of the premium. So some employees who want to provide some benefit for their employers, 
you could pay the employee share of the premium. That is allowed under the family plan. Employers are responsible for providing to the division the employee's wages on a quarterly basis. So my hope is since January 1st of 2023, every quarter we've been submitting to the division, the family division, the wages that the employees are providing to the program. The program also allows sole proprietors and independent contractors to opt in. Those two sole proprietors and independent contractors can opt into the program under certain guidelines. If they opt in, they're agree, they're agreeing to uh, participate in paying premiums and reporting income for a minimum of three years. And the reason why they're saying three years in order to avoid only opting in when they foresee that they're going to be using this benefit. Starting January 2024, paid family leave, the program will start paying out benefits to qualified employees who earn, who have earned 2500 for the previous year for work performed in Colorado. So come January 1, that's when the program will begin to provide benefits to qualified employees. And what are, how can an employee utilize these benefits? Employees can utilize family benefits for new born the first year after birth, adoption, and foster care, for care of family members for serious health conditions, for serious health conditions of themselves, making arrangements for family members for military deployment, obtaining safe housing care, and legal assistance in response to domestic violence, stalking, sexual assaults, or sexual abuse. So as you can see, an employee can use the family's program for a number of reasons. What the benefit, what the payout is, under family, a qualified employee will get up to 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave. If the individual's medical condition was either a pregnancy complication or a childbirth complication, complication, the act adds an additional four weeks of paid benefits or a total of 16. So the normal benefit will pay out 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks of paid benefit. If the condition is either a complication with a pregnancy or childbirth, an additional four weeks could be added to the paid leave for an addition for a total of 16 weeks. Family, the act allows employees to utilize the benefit continuously, intermittently, or in a reduction in work schedule. The employee will tell the employer how they want to utilize their paid family and medical leave. The leave will pay up to 90% of the employee's weekly rate. Again, based upon a sliding scale. The good thing about family, the family's program is the company has no responsibility. Qualifying employees submit their requests directly to family. If Wes Garnett, who is working for company A, if I have a family, if I have a request for to want to utilize my paid family and medical leave, I don't submit that to my employer. I submit it directly to the family's program and they make a decision 
whether I qualify or I don't, not the employer. The employer doesn't have any any minimum amount of time of working, again, for the employer. If the employee at any time during their employment with the company feel they need to use family, again, they submit it directly to family, not to the employer themselves. For those larger companies who have federal family medical leave, family medical leave is a program that was established, I think, back in 86, that companies with 50 or more employees are required to provide family and medical leave. If a larger company has a request for the family program, you can also implement that time away from the workplace as family and medical leave. So for those companies, those larger companies, employers, employees requesting paid family leave, they could also utilize that time not not, not only for families program, but for family medical leave of absence. I know it sounds confusing, but again, if you have any questions about it, schedule time with me so we can talk further about it. An employee may choose to use families with other paid time off benefits, and the employer and the employee may mutually agree to to supplement the family's benefit with other paid time off so we can keep the employee whole from a comp stamp, from a wage replacement standpoint. The benefit for families, employees can start can start applying for these benefits third quarter of this year. They can make application to the division for paid family and medical leave. You won't know you have been chosen until after, whether you qualify, until after January 2024. There are some protections for employees under the families program. Any employee that's been working for the employee employer for 180 days is entitled to come back to the same position or the equivalent position upon their return. And again, we know we want to, we don't want to interfere with the employee's rights to utilize families, the family benefit. If an employee feels they need it, they should make application to the division to see if they qualify and the employers should allow them to do that. Again, we don't, want em- employees should not suffer retaliation discrimination for utilizing the family program it's a benefit that they're paying into and they have every right to utilize if a company wants to utilize a similar plan which some companies do to the family they could do so they could do so but it has to be approved by the family division first before it's implemented. You just can't implement your own paid family and medical leave plan. It has to be approved by the division, by the family division. And there's a web link for you to go to if you have more questions about paid family and medical leave insurance program. Healthy Families and Workplace Act. Healthy Families and Workplace Act, it applies to all Colorado companies after January 1 of 2022. And there will be other amendments to this act, believe me, moving forward. And what healthy phlegm, what the act requires, upon upon hiring an employee, the employee begins to accrue paid sick leave of one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours work. You hire someone for every 30 hours work, 
they've earned one hour of paid sick leave, up to a maximum for the year of 48 hours. Under the Healthy Families Act, the employee can only accrue a maximum of 48 hours of paid sick time. Now, employers, remember, it's on the accrual basis for every 30, you're accruing one hour. An employer has the right to front and load for the employees this 48 hours starting immediately if the company wants to do that. If a company wants to front end load the employees, their 48 hours, and eliminate them accruing it based upon every 30 hours work, they're able to do so. The under the healthy families, the act allows employees to carry over unused sick lay, unused sick time from one year to the next. The act allows them to do so up to a maximum of 48 hours. So an employee could carry over if they don't use any of their, an example, in 2021, the employee didn't use any of their paid fa uh, healthy families. They didn't utilize it, so they've accrued 48 hours. They can, they can roll over the whole 48 hours into 2023. You can't roll over more than 48 hours in any one year. And the employer can limit, can limit the use of paid sick leave up to 48 hours per year. Employees must, <clears throat> uh, the employee, an employee requesting healthy families should submit something to their employers, either in writing or verbally. What I just outlined, these are the re these are the circumstances of what employees can use healthy families for, for specific, uh, for specific cir circumstances involving domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, to care for a family member whose school or place of care has closed when grieving, to attend funerals or memorial services, for public health emergencies, the employee determines how much paid sick leave they want to utilize. If an employee uses four or more consecutive days of paid sick time, the employer can request documentation. Let me say that again. If an employer, if an employee uses four or more consecutive sick days, the employer can request documentation. Other than that, the employer shouldn't be asking employees what they're using their sick, healthy family's time for paid sick time. Please make sure you're tracking it. Under healthy families, there's also a provision for public health emergencies. And we can all, we can all remember what 2020 state was under a public health emergency. Under a public health emergency, the employer is required to provide a one-time allotment, two-week allotment of unpaid, of paid time off for a public health emergency. Once a public health emergency is declared by the governor, the person who would declare public health emergencies, there's a one-time allotment of two weeks for full-time employees. So for all full-time employees, there's an additional three hours of paid sick time that would be dumped into their bank of time. For employees who really work less than 40 hours a week, the employer should be tracking the greater number of hours the employee is scheduled 
tour in a 14-day period or the average time the employee works in a 14-day period. They're all employed, all part-time employees. Under healthy families, there is no payout of unused uh, time. If an employee under healthy families, when an employee terminates, they lose any unused paid time that they have. But if they're hired within a six-month period of time, the employer must reinstate all of their unused paid sick time. And let me repeat that again. Under healthy families, you don't have to pay any unused accrued sick time. It's lost at termination. But if you were to rehire the employee after prior to six months, you have to put that unused time back in their bank, back in their bank of time to be to be utilized. For those companies who are on a PTO instead of sick time and vacation time, the state requires you to pay an employee for any unused accrued time under the under a PTO arrangement. Again, if you're confused with PTO, a PTO program and the Health and Families Act, let's schedule some time to talk further about it. Because under PTO, the state requires the employer to pay the employee for any time that they've accrued. For healthy families, it's lost. Posting notices, the act requires companies to have the benefit of healthy families posted within the workplace. So you should be posting the requirements to use Healthy Families and Workplace Act in your workplace so the employees know what it is, what it involves. The act also requires you to retain documents. You have to retain documents based upon the employer's hours worked, as well as sick days accrued, up to two years. And you have to make these records available to requesting employees or members of the division. If an employee requests to see what their PT, remaining PTO time bank is available to them, you have to make that information available to them. And failure to do so, again, can be a violation. Under healthy families, you're required to keep domestic violence related information and uh, uh, regarding the employee and family must be kept confidential. For any domestic violence or related acts should be kept confidential whenever those requests are made to the company. The employee has the right to use accrued sick leave and again, the company should be, shouldn't be retaliating or, or discriminating against the employee for using their paid sick time. Aggrieved employees, employer right, they could go back for two years to bring charges against the employer. So the employer needs to make sure that they are documenting requests for the sleep and making sure that your if requests are made by the employees, you're providing them this their requested information within a 14-day period of time. And again, we provided a website that would give you additional information about Healthy Families and Workplace Act. Notice regarding unemployment insurance. It was effective May of 2022. And what the act requires of the employer, any person leaving the intent of the employer now must provide the employee a document informing them that they might have unemployment benefits. This contains specific information. The information in this document should contain the employer's name and address, identity number, or the last four of the social security number, the start date, 
the last day the employee worked, a year to date in earnings, wages for the last week the employee worked, and reason for the separation. We provided this is a copy of the form that you should be utilizing with every employee that leaves your employment. If the employee leaves employment with you, you should hand them a copy of this to take with them at their separation. Colorado's bag free and plastic bag and styrofoam bag. Effective January 1, there was a statewide bag. January 1, 2024, there will be a statewide plastic bag ban and a statewide ban on the use of styrofoam in terms of takeout. There are some exemptions to this ban. Establish, establishments must follow the plastic bag ban if their restaurants with three or more locations, major grocery stores and supermarkets, major convenience stores, major liquor stores, major retailers, and other stores providing plastic shopping bags. Under the ban, these, these organizations must follow this ban. These companies are exempt from the ban. Smaller stores with three or fewer locations, farm outside markets, laundries or dry cleaning services, pharmacies, and bulk stores. They're exempt from the bag fee. Under the site, under the styrofoam ban, restaurants, major grocery stores, supermarkets, major convenience stores, other major retail establishments, cafeterias in schools, prisons, and businesses, organizations that are exempt, farmers and roadside markets, stores whose primary revenue doesn't come from food products. And again, we provided a link to you to provide information on the styro, the bag fees and styrofoam. The last law is the Colorado Savings, Secured Savings Program. It became effective January 1st, 2023. It was created by the Colorado Secured Savings Board of the Colorado Department of Treasury. It's a savings plan for employees. It's a saving plan for employees to help again with retirement. All businesses of two years or older with five or more employees who have worked 180 days register their company. There's no cost to the employer. employer. Participation is voluntary. Employees can opt in or out and enroll at any time. Employees can, uh, and employers can exempt out of the secured savings if you have your own retirement plan in place for employees. You don't have to opt into the secured savings. An employer is not responsible for investment decisions. That's all that is being done by the program itself. If you have any question about the Colorado Secured Savings Program, again, we provided a link. That concludes the presentation. Again, if anyone in attendance has any questions about the presentations or about compliance, here's my contact information. Call me or email me and let's schedule a one-on-one -on -one minute meeting so I could provide information to you. Thanks so much for your attendance. Thank you so much, Wes. I've attached a lot of the links Wes was talking about in the chat. Um, his email address is there as well. Thank you.